and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The four horsemen of the apocalypse have challenged the imagination of every generation since the end of the first century. Moving relentlessly across history, they wield great destructive power over humanity. But are these ominous riders relevant in the 21st century? Through the biblical book of Revelation, Jesus Christ opens a prophetic scroll sealed in seven places. As each seal is broken open, specific conditions and events prophesied to affect the entire world are revealed. Galloping free from the restriction of the first four seals are individually colored horses and their threatened riders. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. This vision reveals specific images, symbols of something intended to help readers understand coming events. The first rider carries a bow and wears a crown. The original Greek says a laurel wreath, the ancient symbol of a conquering victor. But what does it all mean? This horseman has often been confused with the returning Christ described in chapter 19 of the same book, because he also rides a white horse. Many believe that the first rider pictures the gradual triumph of organized Christian religion beginning 2,000 years ago. But Revelation 19 reveals a different individual than chapter 6. The returning Christ is dressed in a robe stained with blood, wearing multiple crowns. The Greek is diadems, not a laurel wreath. He is accompanied by angelic beings on white horses, and his weapon is the sword of his mouth, not a bow. The obvious differences between the two images suggest that the first of the four horsemen represents a counterfeit or false messiah. And this is exactly what we find in the explanation that Jesus himself gave to his disciples more than 60 years before this vision, as he told them about the future progression of world conditions. The disciples asked, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus first warned that events seeming to indicate the end is imminent do not necessarily mean that it is. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. Then he added the first global condition to be aware of. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. In a parallel account, the same deceivers claim, I am He. Jesus' warning here about not being fooled parallels the first broken seal in the book of Revelation. He clearly identifies the white horse and its rider. People who claim to be the anointed one are false messiahs, men who counterfeit the future role of the true returning Christ. A counterfeit is not easy to spot. It's so close that it could be the real thing, except to the trained eye. So Jesus warned against being deceived by human beings who claim to be the Messiah. That's to say, specially chosen and anointed by God to rule. Such people present themselves as the only ones who can solve all problems. Others have combined religion and politics in their efforts to be the anointed one. Take the 4th century Roman Emperor Constantine. He's the man credited with Christianizing the Roman Empire. Yet his claims to be equal with the apostles, even God's agent, were not borne out by his behavior. Other more recent examples include Napoleon, Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler, and Mao All of them took advantage of the language of religion and its imagery, stirring up religious fervor and got their followers to worship them, believing they had all the answers. Of course, all these false messiahs failed precisely because they were false. They also brought great destruction on the world, including their own people. In many cases, millions died because of their violent rule, their purges and their wars. For a more detailed look at these examples, take a look at our previous episodes 
where we talk about false messiahs. Deceit comes in many forms and the counterfeit white horseman will continue to ride until he's vanquished by Christ at his coming. Almost every one of these false messiahs led their followers into war and that's the same next step in the sequence of the four riders. In the wake of false messiahs would come the scourge of war, represented by the rider of the red horse. Yet even widespread war would not necessarily mean the end was imminent. Take heed that no one deceives you, he said. Then Jesus added, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. By those in rebellion against the gospel as the Antichrist, and the Antichrist, the last and final Pope of Rome that will be will be the Antichrist, the Pope will be received, will be welcomed, will be believed as Christ himself on earth. As a matter of fact, we have enough evidence and proof throughout history that in that dynasty, dynasty of popes, already Pope has been declared himself as God on earth, including the present Pope. He is, according to the official title, Vicar of Christ on earth. To as Vicarius Filidae, from which title in Latin come 666. Every syllable in Latin, he gives the value of a Roman number that the total come to be 666. Not only he has the mark, not only he bear the number of a man, but he himself become the fusion of these two power, political and religious power. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. The first seal foretells the rise of the popes, as they claim to be vice-regents of the Saviour, they go forth, conquering and to conquer. The description of this Antichrist is markedly similar in some ways to that of the real Saviour, given in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 14. These similarities have deceived masses who have failed to note the differences. First of all, she's a city built on seven hills. The beasts seven heads are seven mountains or or hills on which the woman sitteth several cities sit on seven hills but john's vision eliminates all but one emblazoned on her forehead are the words mystery babylon saddam hussein began building iraq's ancient city of babylon headquarters of the first world empire Today, though Saddam is no longer in control of Iraq and construction has ceased, many Christian leaders teach that the woman is that city, rebuilt as world headquarters for the Antichrist. But the Bible says that the fourth empire headquartered in Rome will be brought back to life, not the Babylonian empire. And Babylon was not built on seven hills. Rome was and has been known universally as the city of seven hills. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, it is within the city of Rome, called the city of seven hills, that the entire area of Vatican state proper is now confined. Interestingly, Rome was also known as Babylon. Catholic apologist Carl Keating writes, Babylon is a code word for Rome. <laughs> It's used that way six times in the last book of the Bible and in extra-biblical works such as Sibylline Oracles, the Apocalypse of Baruch, and Esdras. Uh, Eusebius Pamphilius, writing about 303, noted that Peter referred to Rome figuratively as Babylon. Could Rome be the woman on the beast? That would make good sense, 
because the beast she rides is the revived Roman Empire. This woman is also called the great whore with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Obviously, literal whoredom and fornication would be impossible for a city, but spiritual fornication would be possible if the city were a spiritual entity. Jerusalem is such a city. It is called the holy city and the city of God, having been chosen by God to represent him to the nations. Tragically, Jerusalem violated that relationship and was repeatedly accused by God's prophets of spiritual harlotry and adultery. Isaiah said of Jerusalem, how is the faithful city become a harlot? Jerusalem, however, can't be the woman riding the beast because it wasn't built on seven hills, nor does it meet any of the other criteria in John's vision. One other city, and only one in the world, is a spiritual entity and could therefore commit spiritual fornication with the kings of the earth. And it is built on seven hills. Again, that city is Rome, the headquarters of Roman Catholicism, which declares itself to be the headquarters of the true church. Its Pope claims to be the Vicar of Christ. Moreover, the Roman Catholic Church asserts that its members have replaced Israel, the true people of God, and that Rome is therefore the new Jerusalem. Catholic Rome claims the very titles God gave to Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of God, and even the eternal city. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The second horse. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. War has plagued humanity since the beginning of civilization. And Jesus said that it would continue to be so until the end because it is a natural consequence of false claims, wrong ideas, misguided policies, and ruinous philosophies put forward by leaders with selfish ambition. Joseph Stalin's 20th century record was certainly worse. Violence and war, domestic and international, characterized his regime. Cynical manipulation of religious sentiment underscored the duplicity of what in pure numbers was arguably one of the most murderous regimes in history. 
we could talk in detail about the warfare and violence of other false messiahs of the 20th century, including Mussolini and Mao, Cambodia's Pol Pot, and the Kim regime of North Korea. The story would be the same, totalitarian cruelty, imprisonment, and the deaths of millions. The Red Horseman rides in the wake of the false messiah. False Christs bring on total war. When Jesus told his disciples about the conditions that would long precede his return, he was also recognizing that human beings have certain tendencies. Like sheep, they follow false messiahs down the path to war, and they're inclined to accept the inevitability of war. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children.
to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Set free to gallop across the earth some 2,000 years ago, the Four Horsemen continue to pose dangerous threats to a largely unsuspecting world. In this episode, we'll discuss the third in the sequence, the Black Horse, and what its rider brings on humanity. As John's vision shows, the Red Horseman of War can be a lead-in to a third devastating condition. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Seeing eye, this is a very prominent structure that is used in all of Islam. And you will not find a taxi cab anywhere in the Islamic countries that will not have the all-seeing eye there as a protection. Of course, it's used in Catholicism as well, and it's on the US dollar and all these interesting places. There's, of course, the eye of Hathor, the eye of Osiris on an Egyptian temple. There it is on a Roman Catholic pulpit, another one on a Roman Catholic cathedral. Masonic author Carl Claudy writes, this is one of the oldest and most widespread symbols denoting God. We find it in Egypt, in India, the open eye of Egypt represents Osiris. In India, Siva is represented by an eye, and the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry says, the all-seeing eye is an important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by Freemasonry from antiquity. On the same principle, the Egyptian represented Osiris. So, Islam uses the symbol, Catholicism uses the symbol. I'm just showing you some comparisons. To the ancient Egyptians, the right eye symbolized the sun, the left eye the moon. So there you have, again, the two aspects of the sun god. Bailey then goes on to mention, this is Alice A. Bailey, that the eye of God is Shiva or Siva, the destroyer. Remember, Shiva is the Indian god who is the equivalent of Osiris. Shiva is also a synonym for Satan. Is it possible that both religions in the inner circle worship the same Lucifer, but that the outer court knows nothing about this? Well, who is Baal? Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, whenever the Israelites made one of their almost periodical deflections to idolatry, Baal seems to have been their favorite idol. In Tyre, Baal was the sun, Ashtoreth the moon, and so we have all the evidence that they know exactly what they're doing. There is no contradiction here, for Set is the Egyptian devil and Shiva is the Indian god of destruction. Both names Set and Shiva are listed in the Satanic Bible as another name for Satan. And Elena Petrovna Blavatsky affirms, now we have to remember that Siva, Shiva, Palestinian Baal or Moloch and Satan are identical. Is it possible that both religions serve the same master behind the scenes and that the masses are deceived, just like in Catholicism? The Society of Jesus, as the Jesuits are formally known, was started in the 1530s by Ignatius of Loyola. And he was a Basque soldier who compiled a series of esoteric spiritual exercises. 
which when performed, well, they were performed by all of the male order and there are no Jesuit sisters. So these spiritual exercises consists of mental exercises, meditations, prayers, and other practices which were designed to improve a person's spiritual vitality. The rest of his life for his mystic powers. In Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough and Secret Societies of All Ages by Hecathorn, we learned that at the time there was an organization called the Alumbrado or the Illuminati in Spain. The Inquisition determined that Ignatius had been a member of this occult intellectual society and threw him in the jail there at the Inquisition. Upon his release, he's made his way to Salamanca, to the great university there, but again, he was brought under suspicion of being an Illuminist, and he was thrown in the Inquisition again. Now, upon being released, he made his way to the great University of Paris in France, and there he gathered intelligent young men around him, brought them under the control of the power of his mind, and these became the basis of his society. Not too far from the university, they dedicated themselves to the new order of the Jesuits there in Montmartre. Today there's a tremendous chapel on Montmartre, one of the most magnificent chapels that we saw while we were in Europe. And it's dedicated to the destruction of democracy and liberty in the world. Ignatius from there made his way to Rome, and in time he was accepted by the Pope. The Reformation had destroyed the influence of the Church in many parts of Europe. In the book, The Ignatian Fireworks or Fiery Jesuits, published in 1667, it's right here in the vaults at PUC if you want to read it, we read the aged gentleman Paul III, who then sat in the infallible chair, foreseeing the need of need the papacy had of incendiaries to vex the enemies to its grandeur easily grants the petition of Ignatius and his disimures prostrate at his holiness's feet where after sweet kisses and token of their obedience they receive an institution of their predominant sect from that time Rome was the center of this new satanic system the Jesuit order Abraham Lincoln 1809 to 1865, 16th President of the United States of America. This war, the American Civil War, 1860 to 1865, would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. Though there were great differences of opinion between the South and North, on the question of slavery, neither Jeff Davis nor any one of the leading men of the Confederacy would have dared to attack the North had they not relied on the promise of the Jesuits that under the mask of democracy, the money and the arms of the Roman Catholics, even the arms of France, were at their disposal if they would attack us. The Protestants of both the North and South would surely unite to exterminate the priests and the Jesuits if they could learn how the priests and nuns and the monks which daily land on our shores under the pretext of preaching their religion are nothing else but the emissaries of the Pope, of Napoleon III and the other despots of Europe to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroy our schools, and prepare a reign of anarchy here as they have done in Ireland, in Mexico, in Spain, and wherever they are, any people who want to be free. I am so glad to meet you again, he said. You see that your friends, the Jesuits, have not yet killed me, but they would have surely done it when I passed through the most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not defeated their plans by passing incognito a few hours before they expected me. New projects of assassination are detected almost every day, accompanied with such savage circumstances that they bring to my memory the massacre of St. Bartholomew and the gunpowder plot. We feel at their investigation that they come from the same masters in the art of murder, the Jesuits. 
So many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed when we consider that the great majority of them were in the hands of skillful Roman Catholic murderers evidently trained by the Jesuits. I know that Jesuits never forget nor forsake, but man must not care how and where he dies, provided he dies at the post of honor and duty. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. In Matthew's Gospel, he added this warning, and there will be famines in various places. It's well established that as war takes its toll, food supplies dwindle. War causes disruption of food production and distribution chains. People are often unable to buy what little remains, and desperation and theft spread quickly. In the first century, a denarius would be about a day's wages. And wheat for human consumption was generally more valuable than barley, which was mostly used for animal feed. The comment about not harming the oil and wine may be ironic if suppliers were profiting from producing more lucrative items like wine and oil and cutting back on staple foods, making famine worse. Devastating food shortages certainly happened centuries later in the collapse of the Roman Empire as invading tribes attacked the overextended superpower. 1735-1826, second president of the United States of America. In 1816, John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, regarding the restoration of the Society of Jesus. My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities, is very particular and very horrible. Their restoration is indeed a step toward darkness, cruelty, perfidy, despotism, death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits. If ever there were a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. We are compelled by our system to offer them asylum. Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769 to 1821, Emperor of the French. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. 
And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time, the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master sovereign over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a meritorious work, if committed for the interest of the society of the Jesuits or by the order of the general. The Marquis de Lafayette, 1757 to 1834, a French statesman and general. It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country the United States of America are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe. Friedrich von Hardenberg, 1772-1801, German philosopher. Never before in the course of the world's history had such a society, that is, the Jesuit order, appeared. The old Roman Senate itself did not lay schemes for world domination with greater certainty of success. André Marie Jean Jacques Dupin, 1783-1865, a French statesman. The Jesuits are a naked sword whose hilt is at Rome, but its blade is everywhere, invisible until its stroke is felt. Samuel Morse, 1791-1872, American inventor of the telegraph. They are Jesuits. This society of men after exerting their tyranny for upwards of 200 years, at length became so formidable to the world, threatening the entire subversion of all social order, that even the Pope, whose devoted subjects they are, and must be, by the vow of their society, was compelled to dissolve them. They had not been suppressed, however, for 50 years before the waning influence of popery and despotism required their useful labors to resist the light of democratic liberty and the Pope, Pius VII, simultaneously with the formation of the Holy Alliance, revived the order of the Jesuits in all their hourly. From their vow of unqualified submission to the sovereign pontiff, they have been appropriately called the Pope's bodyguard. And do Americans need to be told what Jesuits are? They are a secret society, a sort of Masonic order, with super-added features of revolting odiousness, and a thousand times more dangerous. They are not merely priests or of one religious creed, they are merchants and lawyers and editors and men of any profession having no outward badge in this country by which to be recognized. They are about in all your society. They can assume any character, that of angels of light or ministers of darkness, to accomplish their one great end, the service upon which they are sent. Whatever that service may be, they are all educated men, prepared and sworn to start at any moment and in any direction, and for any service, commanded by the general of their order, bound to no family, community, or country by the ordinary ties which bind men, and sold for life to the cause of the Roman pontiff. And who are these agents? They are, for the most part, Jesuits an ecclesiastical order proverbial through the world for cunning, duplicity, and total want of moral principle.
an order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable and the people required its suppression. Priest Antoine Arnaud, 1612 to 1694. Do you wish to excite troubles, to provoke revolution, to produce the total ruin of your country? Call in the Jesuits and build magnificent colleges for these hot-headed religionists. Suffer those audacious priests in their dictatorial and dogmatic tone to decide on affairs of state. The four horsemen of the apocalypse each signifies a dangerous threat to the world. In this episode, we'll discuss the fourth in the sequence, the pale or pallid horse, and the great difficulties its rider brings. As John's vision outlines, the white, red, and black horsemen of deception, war, and famine can be the lead-in to a fourth devastating condition. In the book of Revelation, where Jesus is seen opening a scroll sealed in seven places, the fourth broken seal gives the identity of the fourth horseman. Beyond the death and devastation brought about by the first three horses and their riders comes the next. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. In Matthew's Gospel, some of Christ's disciples came to him on the Mount of Olives looking for information about the end of this age and the beginning of the Kingdom of God. Jesus gave several warnings about ongoing conditions that would typify the world's decline. And he warned not to be deceived into thinking it's the end when false messiahs, war and famine disrupt the world. Now he gave a fourth condition, which like the others signals only the beginning of the process that leads to the end. He said, and there will be pestilences in various places. This parallels the fourth horseman's ride, 
His horse is gray-green or yellowish-green, like the color of so many who are sick and dying. Fulfilling to the prophecy today. When we hear about color, all what we have to do is to look around us, right in our contemporary history, right through past history. Just look around. Don't go into future history. Leave it to God. Go to past history. Go to present history and begin to see. Begin to see. No more reading. No more hearing. Begin to see what you hear, what for so long you have read. Begin to see it. This is why the emphasis is come and see. Come and see. Not come and hear, no more. Not come and read, no more. Come and see. There is color in this prophecy. There is color in this horse. Why we don't look for color? Simple as that. Look for colors. Just leave numbers around, leave interpretations around, just look for what literally the Bible is speaking about. If he said for color white, let's look for color white. Let's identify whatever is color white, then let's identify who is wearing color white, who is dressing in white. If we call for color red, let's look color red, let's begin to look. Children can understand even this prophecy if you were about to believe it. You don't have to wait your children become. Just tell them to begin to look for symbolic, not the symbol of red. What is that? Who is wearing this symbol? What has been the role of red in past history? What has been the role? What has been the role? As the role of why? Where has been? The emphasis of red, all the political powers. Every major political power has taken red as the identity color of power, of destruction. They did it, the Babylonians, beginning with the old Babylonian. You can see the relationship with the present Babylon, the Vatican. Always the cardinals, what color you? Red. Impressive. No, it's reality. Why? Why no the priest? No, they don't allow the priest because the priest do not have the power that a cardinal had. That is why. It's not just because they like red color, it's because they have power that a priest doesn't have. Why? Colors have meaning and have prophetical meaning. You better believe it. Why the black horse? Let's look for a black color. Let's look around. Who has been wearing color as a symbol of power? Black. At the end, from Babylonia down to the Roman Empire, down to fascism, down to communism. Another white horse as the papacy. We knew who was the rider of the red horse as the political power that is back in the papacy, has been always back in the papacy, behind the popes of Rome, in different countries, under different reigns and empires and governments. And then we see the rider of the black horse as the most potential mystical power that ever has been. Satan displaying on planet Earth that was Ignatius of Lozola. This is why it was not a name on the writer, because it's not just Ignatius of Lozola, but the general Jesuits. You see, they kept a succession of generals as the popes. The only two dynasties in the world that will fail this process. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I hear the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. Again, come and see. And I look, not I hear, I look. And behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. Now, it's impressive to know that the rider of the white horse bear no name, that the rider of the red horse bear no name, and the rider of the black horse bear no name, but the rider of the pale horse bear name. In conclusion, 
the angel revealed and Christ revealed to his church that this pale horse, pale horse, the rider of this pale horse, is the final solution that the reversion of the gospel has brought about upon this earth. Now that is the final solution for those who have revealed against the gospel and for those who prefer religious tradition and a religious authority rather than the authority of the Bible and rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a very bad solution, death, because those who obey the gospel and those who believe that the final authority is the Bible and matters of belief and matters of faith will be given no death, will be given life, eternal life. And when he has opened the fourth seal, I hear the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I look and behold a pale horse, and his name that said on him was death, and hell followed with him. What that means is, there is no other alternative after this. I mean, there is nothing more after that. This is final. He's not only dead, but he's hell. And precisely, death and hell will be brought at the end of everything, will be brought to the lake of fire, this very book said. Follow with him. Not just hell follow him, follow with him. What that means is that those who are following the rider of the pale horse, those who are forming part of the pale horse, and we will know very soon who are the ones that compose that pale horse. Even the color bring revelation about those who identify with the pale horse, with the rider. Now listen to this. Let's go to the color as we are concluding now with the full color. As you will watch by watching right now, by seeing, you will see these colors. You will see the combinations of color, I will call the combination of color. First, I call your attention to the fact that the white color and the pale color symbolize one a special flag that is already in the United Nations. <gasps> a flag representing a power, a flag representing a country, is here already in prophecy. The Church's relationship with the Muslims is the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God. There's an excellent little bitty comic book called The Prophet you can get from our ministry. It's like $2 or something like that uh, by Jack Chick. He goes through the history of the Muslim Church and how they started. Very few people realize it was the Catholics that started Islam. They started the whole religion purposely to try to get the Holy Land back for the Catholics. They built up the Islam, <clears throat> they, they funded Muhammad, they trained him, they sent a Catholic nun out of the monastery, they said we want you to come out of your co convent, go find a young promising uh, Muslim, marry him, and train him to raise up an army of Arabs to go take back the Holy Land for the Mother Church. Quite an interesting story, if you want to read about that. It, it started to work, but then it failed because the Islam got so big, they said, well, forget you Catholics, we're doing what we want. And I don't think most Muslims, which is now, what, 10, 20% of the world population, Islam, I don't think most of them know that they really started off as a front for the Catholic Church. So let's cover just a little bit on Muslims. Ask the Muslim, how do you know Muhammad was a prophet? 
They'll say, well, he had a mole on his back. Holy moly. In John's apocalyptic vision, the pale horse's rider is accompanied by Hades, the grave, the last resting place of the terminally ill. Then comes this summary statement about what the four horsemen have caused in total in terms of human life. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. In combination, the riders of the four horses bring death to 25% of the world's population. It's a sickening statistic, even more so when you realize that much of it comes at man's own hand. The four horsemen's ride began some 2,000 years ago and continues to this day. Yet despite all the terrible death and destruction they bring, there is good news at the end of their terrible ride. The same Jesus who showed the meaning of the mysterious four riders will also come to put an end to their destruction. As the true Messiah, he will replace the white horseman's final false Messiah and his false prophet. He will establish a society based on truth, not deception. Christ will also come as the Prince of Peace to eradicate the war and violence brought on by the red horseman. One of Christ's other names is Yahweh Yireh, the faithful God who provides. So at his return, he will end famine by providing rainfall in the right season and abundant yields of food. At that time, epidemic disease and sickness in general will give way to the work of Christ, who's also named Yahweh Rapha, the faithful God who heals. Then the four horsemen will be no more, and the effects of their destructive ride across the earth will be a remnant of the past to be quickly forgotten.